Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone at home can hear me and can uh, clearly see the slide. Yeah. Why your one cannot full yeah. screen? Yeah, can see. Can you hear me? Can, can, thank you. Okay. 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 Uh, today, I would like to uh, present about crash injury and also a little bit of compartment syndrome. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the learning outcomes for today is definition, the pathophysiology, the diagnosis, and also the management, lastly. Okay, what is crash injury? <clears throat> so, uh, crash injury is a compression of extremities or other parts of the body that is uh, let's say there's an obstacle on your leg. So there'll be muscle swelling. So, and subsequently, there will be neuro, neurological disturbance. As for compartment syndrome, there is a result of excessive pressure within the facial compartment. This would decrease the perfusion and also the tissue function. Lastly, the crash syndrome. Crash, crash, crash syndrome is a crash injury with a systemic manifestation. So let's say there's a skeletal muscle injury. So there will be disruption of cellular integrity and the release of its content into the circulation. Basically, from what I understand, crash injury will cause crash syndrome and subsequently can, crush, uh, can cause compartment syndrome. Okay. Right. So next, I will talk about the pathophysiology of the crash injury. So there are three main things of the pathophysiology crash injury. Firstly, is traumatic rhabdomyolysis, secondary, <coughs> secondly is hypovolemia, and thirdly is reperfusion syndrome. So what is traumatic rhabdomyolysis? Okay, let's take an example. Let's say uh, there's a wall on your right leg. So there will be injury to your uh, leg, lah, right leg. So there will be uh, injury to your skeletal muscle. So when there is injury of skeletal muscle, there will be release of your intracellular content, which is there will be calcium, chan calcium channel influx and also release of other electrolytes such as potassium, phosphate, myoglobin, CK, and uric acid into the circulation. So let's take one by one. <clears throat> For hypocalcemia and hyperkalemia, okay, uh, when there is a calcium channel influx, it will go into the uh, muscle. So that will, that will cause hypocalcemia, right? So, and then hyperkalemia, it will go out to the circulation. This will cause arrhythmias. And if it worsens, there will cause cardiac arrest. The second one is anaerobic metabolism. Okay. When there is the calcium channel influx, okay, it will disrupt the uh, ATP production. Okay, when disrupt the ATP production, then there will be anaerobic metabolism. So what will meta anaerobic, uh, anaerobic metabolism produce? It will produce lactic acid as the byproduct. So if it worsening, then the patient might be go into metabolic acidosis. Okay, next is increased level of myoglobin. So as you all know, injury to our skeletal muscle will uh, release the myoglobin. So too much myoglobin, we will, the body will try to excrete. So to excrete, they will go through the kidney. So however, in our kidney, we have heptoglobin. Heptoglobin will try to uh, attach with the myoglobin. But too much myoglobin, we cross myoglobinuria, which is always we see dark colored urine. Okay. okay. Right. So this is the table to understand how does it happen. So the firstly, we take from the sarcolemma membrane destruction. There will be influx of CA. That's how we, that's how we get all those three, rhabdomyolysis, 
uh, metabolic acidosis, and also the last one is uh, myoglobinuria. Okay, come back. All right. <coughs> so the, the second one is hypovolemia. How can hypovolemia occurs? Okay, so <coughs> okay. when hypovolemia, hypovolemia, we can uh, divide into acute kidney injury and also sequestration of the large volume of fluids. Okay, I talked about the acute kidney injury. Lah. So when there is hypovolemia, there will be vessel constriction and hypoperfusion of the kidney. All right? Um, eh? So there will be less blood flowing to the kidney. So in order to save the GFR, to preserve the function of GFR, which are platinine, so there will be rest stimulation. Okay, renin angiotensin stimulation. So it will uh, vasoconstrict the arterioles in the kidney more. So that's why you can get AKI. All right, uh, next one. Uh, myoglobin, too much, just I, like I mentioned before, myoglobin, too much myoglobin will react in the thumb phosphor protein. Thumb phosphor protein, we can see in the, uh, in the ascending loop of Henle, okay? Ascending loop in the kidney. So when there is react with thumb phosphor protein, it will precipitate and forming a pus. This will cause uh, acidic urine. Okay. The third one is myoglobin. Myoglobin itself is already nephrotoxic. So that's how it can cause AKI. Next, uh, the second one is sequestration of large, fluid, uh, large volume of fluids. So your fluids already gone up. So there are no uh, upper extracellularity. So that will cause hypovolemic shock if we don't cover properly and hypovolemic shock can cause death also, right? Next. <clears throat> now it's worsening, okay. Uh, the case is, I mentioned that there is a boulder on your right leg. So now you are removing the boulder. So we might be having reperfusion syndrome. Why? Okay, it's already like some sort of ischemia or some sort of injury. So there will be Perfusion of the ischemia muscle. Ischemic muscle will generate oxygen free radical. This will cause the destruction of the cell membrane, which leads to cellular edema. Subsequently, can go to compartment syndrome. Why can get compartment syndrome? Because you have to remember we have our muscle, and our muscle is covered by fascia, and fascia is not elastic. So that's why you can get compartment syndrome, which I will talk again after this. Okay, how to diagnose uh, crush injury? Okay, the most important part of this uh, diagnosis is rhabdomyolysis because we are playing with the fluids. Next, there are many causes of rhabdomyolysis, not just crush injury. It could be uh, medication such as statin, sternus workout, eh, myositis, uh, alcohol intoxication, and also uh, your prolonged compression, okay? This is the picture of rhabdomyolysis. Usually we become severe muscle cramp and pain, and also the patient will present with dark color urine, okay? Or Coca-Cola urine. Ah. The next picture is just a simple picture, torn muscle, myoglobin goes into the renal and can develop T-colored urine. There are a few investigation to diagnose uh, rhabdo, uh, traumatic rhabdomyolysis. Okay, just like I mentioned before, there will be electrolyte changes in the rhabdomyolysis, such as there is hypocalcemia and hyperkalemia because potassium already out from to the circulation, and also increase of phosphate and also myoglobin. Okay, you can uh, you can take the RP and electrolytes for this patient. Okay, isolated AST elevation. Why? Okay. Uh, I have read some article. It says that AST is present abundance in skeletal muscle, where ALT still have but lesser in extent. So you, you also have CK, AST, and ALT. So if you don't have CK, you see the AST is increasing. So you can uh, put in uh, lab proofs for diagnosis. Okay. Right. The third one is urinalysis. Patient come. Colored urine, then you send for UFAM. UFAM is blood three plus. 
So I want to confirm back. So that's why we send for urinalysis. Urinalysis will show RBC don't have. Why? Why RBC don't have? Because the myoglobin itself is colored, uh, the T colored urine. Okay. Correct. Next one is creatinine kinase. We always take this. Next one is creatinine kinase. We always take this. Okay, the first picture is the rough classification of rhabdomyolysis. This is based on CK level. Okay, so usually, um, as we all know, rhabdomyolysis is one of the complications of skeletal muscle injury. So usually, the normal level CK is 40 to 200. Okay, as well as mild rhabdomyolysis, 1000 to 500, and moderate uh, rhabdomyolysis is 5,000 to 15,000, and subsequently to, goes to severe rhabdomyolysis. Why is it very important about uh, the CK level? Because it predicts us whether this patient is having AKI or worsening AKI. But the problem is, okay, when this patient came in, coming to you with t colored urine and all, so you can see the graph, the graph there, okay? CK will only started to rise about four to six hours and will it will pick up until 36 hours. Whereas myoglobin, the first you get and can last it until 24 hours. Myoglobin is nephrotoxic, but CK is not nephrotoxic. That's, that's when we can use CK versus McMahon. Okay. I will explain after this. Okay. Um, McMahon score. We have uh why we do why why do we want uh McMahon score? Because it can predict AKI or worsening kidney function in rhabdomyolysis. So usually the score we, we will always take is more than six. Okay. The first one is H. Okay. Sex initial creatinine and calcium, initial CK. Phosphate and initial bicarb. If let's say the patient has second, rhabdo secondary to seizure, syncope, exercise, statin, or myositis, also we have the score. But don't fret not, I will explain after this. Okay. So this is how you want to diagnose your rhabdomyolysis. Okay. You already have the sign and symptom. Okay, muscle pain, T colic urine. Next, the cause of the uh, the cause of the knee is crash injury. You also have elevated AST and suggestive of urinalysis. So you want to take your creatinine kinase. Okay. okay. However, there's a problem with it. Your CK is 1,000, uh, is, is 1,500. So it's actually mild rhabdomyolysis. So that's why you want to calculate your McMahon score. Okay. If your McMahon score uh, is less than six, so there will be lower risk for AKI. If McMahon score, if more than six, then you can start with fluid resuscitation, even though the CK level is around my rhabdomyolysis only, 1,500 to 2,000, okay? Right? If the CK already 5,000, then we can start our treatment. Okay. Okay. The McMahon score, can facilitate without waiting the CK level, okay, to rise above 5,000 uh, unit, okay? We have few studies, actually, we have two studies to valid, validate the uh, McMahon score, whether it, does it superior to CK itself or not, okay? The first score is a risk prediction score for kidney failure or mortality in rhabdomyolysis, okay? So, uh, the predict prediction score for failure or mortality in our patient varies widely, not the CK, but clinical context. The risk of RRT or in-hospital mortality uh, with rhabdo is commonly using the demographic, your clinical judgment, your comorbidities, and also lab variables, not the CK. Okay, understand? Eh? All right. The next one is rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury. CK as a prognostic marker and validation of the McMahon score. Okay. Um, according to the study, this CK 
it's not uh, specific for to 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 tell that it's worsening AKI in lepto because CK is delayed, just like I mentioned before. So that's why we use McMahon score because the sensitivity and specificity specificity is almost the same. The sensitivity is around eighty five percent. The specificity is sixty eight percent. It's almost the same as a CK alone. That's why we use McMahon score. All right. Next, I want to talk about the management of crash injury. These are very important in our management setting. We have pre-hospital management and also in-hospital management. Okay, for pre-hospital management, we have volume replacement, analgesia, mangle extremities, and also transportation. For in-hospital management, we have fluid management, treating the electrolyte, limb care, and lastly, is fossil for me. Okay. Right, we talk about the pre-hospital management. Okay, volume replacement. I hope you guys can see this. Okay. 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 Let's say there is a casualty or earthquake or any bangunan runto. So the pre-hospital management plays a very important role. So usually, if the IV access can be established, so we will start isotonic saline, one liter per hour during extrication. Okay. Why isotonic saline? Because it's easy to get, eh? less complication. So the next, we go down to the box. Is the victim still under rubble after two hours? Yes. So we reduce it to 0 0.5 liter per hour. Why? Why do we want to reduce it to 0 0.5 hour per, uh, 0 0.5 liter per hour? Because we are putting too much. I'm afraid there will be overload. That's why I'm worried. Okay. All right, Fahm, eh? okay. And we monitor for six hours. Let's say if the patient still stuck in the bangunan unto, we monitor to six hours. Total fluid we already given is three to six liter. And suddenly is patient anuric. Yes, then we give IV fluid 0 0.5 to one liter plus losses of the previous day. Okay, but don't worry. As long as you know what to give, you know how to manage, and you know you expect there will be fluid overload, so you will be safe, okay? The rate, uh, the rate is reduced because patient cannot be closely monitored. Lah. Let's say bangunan uto, then kita pasang IV drip and all. And how are we going to monitor? Well, we've got a lot of patient already, okay? But, but the actual amount, of course, you have to, uh, you have to think about extent of the injury, Okay, the body mass, okay, the ambient, the temperature, and also the urine output. That's that's also important, lah. Okay, for you to start the uh, IV fluids. Okay, All right. Can we give sodium by cup? Okay, some theoretically, if we give sodium by cup, uh, if we keep the myoglobin floating in circulation, so postponing the renal casting and head soft. Uh, hyperkalemia, but there are no studies proven this yet. But some they will give, but some are not. That's all up to you. Okay. Number two is light pig cocktail. Some UK studies says that some advocates suggest to serve light pig cocktail in crash injury. For me myself, I wouldn't I I wouldn't serve lah light pig cocktail. Okay, because I'm not sure. So I will consult my seniors to ask. Okay, next three is tonique and mangalim. All right. So usually in the movies and also sometimes we can see there is if there's any uh, mangalim, we always put tonique. If there's an obstac obstacle in our uh, right right leg, we always put tonique. Why? We want to save the leg. But the problem this is the actually this is the indication of tonique use. Firstly. First and most important thing, uncontrollable bleeding from a site, amendable to proximal placement of tonic A, okay, life threatening hemorrhage, inadequately controlled with direct pressure, okay, limb amputation or mangled extremity, and 
a sanguating wound associated with shock. That's when we use the tonique, tonique lah. Okay. What about the pulse of tonique application? Okay. Place the tonique as distal as possible, at least 5 cm proximal to the injury. Okay. Spare the joint as much as possible and apply it direct onto the exposed skin. Okay. The time of application should be recorded because we have the golden hours. It's around six, uh, four to six hours. If I'm not mistaken, muscle is around four hours before you get ischemic. And also any amputated limb should be transported with the patient to the hospital. Lah. We cannot leave the leg outside. Okay. All right. I hope you guys can understand so far because we have questions later. Okay. Next is our mangle limb. Okay. Patient having mangle limb. The most important thing is life over limb. And also all patients are candidate for re-implantation unless your ortho surgeon said otherwise. Okay, so this is a care for the amputated segment. Later, I will show you one very famous case in Mid Valley. Okay, irrigate the limb with copious amount of saline, wrap the limb in saline soap gauze, and also place in permeable bag. If once you already cut your leg, you chop your leg, you care for the stump, elevate the limb, irrigate with saline so that it's clean, and cover with wet, wet gauze. Put on screen if unstable. Okay. So when do we use, uh, when do we decide to chop our foot or our leg? We use a mass score. If it's uh, more than seven, then there is increase of amputation. I'm sure every one of us is very familiar with this score. All right. So, this is what I told you. Mid Valley bridge collapse, worker's leg amputated scene on scene to save his life. This had been done by the UM team, the NS, the Ortho, and also the EP. They had to amputate, uh, they had to amputate at the scene. Uh, it's called um, uh, Botilon amputation, if I'm not mistaken. This is the video I will show you guys. Okay. Yeah. So this is what uh, this patient had undergone Gulliton amputation. So as you all can see, yeah, I see. Ah, that's the guy downstairs. So. In order to extricate the patient, so it's very difficult. So they had to do, in order to pull the patient up, they had to chop the leg off. Okay. All right. So I think that's all. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, now the patient already arrived in our hospital. So we have in hospital management. Fluid, uh, we already done fluid resuscitation. Now we want for fluid maintenance. But uh, who should get fluids? Okay, that's that's when our CK, our McMahon will come. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. If the CK is less than 5,000, and the McMahon is six thousand, uh, less than six. We definitely don't give so much fluid, okay? But if the CK is more than five thousand and McMahon is more than six, we initiate the treatment, okay? And next one is CK is more than five thousand. It's still unclear, but uh, yes or no, I will treat this patient, okay? Because uh, CK is already already more than five thousand, although it's McMahon is less than six. This, uh, this is the slide that I showed to you before. Lah. Uh, when, to uh, when to start your uh, fluid resuscitation by using the McMahon score, okay? All right. So this is your uh, rhabdomyolysis treatment for hypovolemia 
euvolemia and hypervolemia. Okay, your Matt Mahon score already in your hand, your CK already in your hand. So history, physical, uh, physical examination, your ECO, your IVC, you have to check. Let's say the patient is hypovolemia, then of course you will start, you will challenge, uh, you will prompt your resuscitation. Okay, uh, volume challenge at around 150 to 200 mil per hour. If the patient is not acidotic, we can use lactate, uh, lactate, ringer, uh, lactate ringers or Hartman or plasma light. If the metabolic acidosis, we can use isotonic bicarb, okay, to reduce, uh, to increase the bicarb lah, okay. If it's hypo hypervolemia, so of course patient already have a lot of fluids already. We don't want to overload this patient, so that's why we will stop. Okay, let's say it's euvolemia and we are trying to uh, resuscitate the patient. So what we should, what should we, what should we monitor? Of course, your urine output, okay. Good urine output. Patient is running. Uh, patient is running net, even slightly positive. We just continue. But poor urine output, we have to stop. Why? Because it is accumulating, uh, accumulating substantial volume. Okay, that's why the negative. So we have to stop. Okay. At the same time, your I/O balance and electrolytes must be carefully monitored. Okay. Right. Type of fluids I give. Okay, sodium bicarb. Okay, sodium by uh, sodium bicarb. In theoretically and also uh, in studies, says that it facilitates in renal excretion of myoglobin. Number two, it reduces the urine acidosis. But be cautious because it can worsen your hypocalcemia. Okay, and patient will get cardiac arrest also later. Okay. If the patient having NACMA or uremic acidosis, okay, isotonic sodium bicarb shows a very good benefit. We can see in bicarb, bicarb ICU trial. Okay, our recommended dosage is one ampule in one liter of half uh, half saline, or two to three ampule in one liter of five percent dextrose. This is on Cal at two thousand and fourteen. Okay. Just an addition point, sodium bicarb can only be given if hypocalcemia not present, arterial pH is less than 7.5, and sodium bicarb is less than 30. Okay. Next, okay, patient, uh, let's say we already given fruits to patient. So there is a study between manitol and versus furosemide. Manitol acts as osmotic diuresis where furosemide Act as loop diuretics that we always use to give as false diuresis. Okay, why do we give manitol? Okay, theoretically only, yeah, it is protective by causing a diuresis, which minima, minimizes the intratubular heme pigment disposition and cast formation. As I informed, as I told you guys, cast formation will stop in the in the and worsen the kidney. Okay, so manitol theoretically will help in uh, reduces the cast formation and minimize this. Okay. If given, adding 50 ml of 20% manitol, maximum in 100, 120 gram to each liter fluid suggested. Okay, but the problem is manitol is nephrotoxic. Okay, that's why we don't give in oliguric or anuric chain. Okay. Whereas for furosemide, it is a loop diuretics. We use it for false diuresis, only to serve if there's evidence of fluids overload. In the ICU setting, what I learned, they always give around 40 to 120 per day. But, but there are no evidence or studies that suggest using loop diuretics will, in AKI, reduce the mortality, need for dialysis, and improve the function of kidney. So, which fluids would you give? Would you give manitol or furosemide? That, that decision, I will put in your hands. Okay? Continuation. So, when there's dialysis indicated, three things, worsening AKI, progressive oliguria or anuria, and worsening hyperkalemia, acidosis, and fluid overload. Okay? 
And why do we really need hemodialysis? Because it removes the myoglobin, hemoglobin, or uric acid in order to prevent the development of kidney injury has, has not been demonstrated. So no studies. All of them is just theoretically, theoretically only, no studies. Okay, when to stop the fluids? Okay, as you all know, I mentioned before, myoglobin is nephrotoxic, not the CK. Okay, myoglobin from zero hours only up to 24 hours. Sometimes we give, uh, whereas the CK started from four, two to four hours up until 36 hours. Okay, usually they will give fluids, fluids, fluids until the CK going down. So we want to, we want to tackle the nephrotoxicity. We want to reduce the nephrotoxicity. Uh, that's why we want to remove the myoglobin. Okay, come eh? All right. <clears throat> so because of it is delayed, lah. That's that's a problem, lah. It is delayed. CK finding is delayed. That's why we need to start uh, our fluid resuscitation as early as possible. And we, if the CK is already around reducing in uh, from five thousand and reducing, we can start to reduce the fluids or subsequently stop the fluids. Very simple. Okay, this is one of the picture of our renal tubules. Okay, just like I mentioned before, uh, we have uh, our loop of Henle where our osmotic agent, which is mannitol, acts on, and our ascending, uh, ascending limb, which our loop uh, diuretics uh, act on. Okay, where can you find the time phosphate protein? It's around the uh, ascending limb. Okay. Okay, next we are treating other complication. Hypokalemia, we give lighter cocktail. Hypokalemia, remember, do not treat. If you treat, you will, because the cal uh, calcium already in flux, if you treat, you will uh, further reduce the hypocalcemia, unless if the patient already developed symptom, lah, arrhythmia, seizure, or tetany. Okay, don't forget to put your continuous cardiac monitoring. Okay. Next one is the limb care, all right. So I mentioned before, we have reperfusion syndrome, uh, releasing of oxygen radical, subsequently will destroy all the muscle and also cause compartment syndrome. Okay, now I will talk about compartment syndrome. Okay, it's very simple. Uh, our human limbs are divided into compartment by strong fascia membrane. You have to remember that fascia is not elastic, okay? So rapid increase of pressure within the compartment can prom compromise the circulation and function of the tissue within the space, okay? Most commonly over the leg and forearm, but anything that have fascia also can. Hand, foot, thigh, buttocks, and shoulder, okay? Understand, eh? All right. There are a few etiologies, increase in compartment content, Decrease in compartment volume, which is compression lah, and external pressure. This is the tissue threshold for ischemia. Our muscle, this is our golden hours, muscle around four hours, nerve eight hours, fat cough, skin 24, and subsequently bone up to three days. Okay. Of course, we already know since medical school also, clinical examination, six piece of the uh, compartment syndrome. Pain, pain, pain. That was my what was my surgeon said before. It's pain, pain, pain out of proportion because the other signs are all the late sign: paresthesia, pallor, pulselessness, poikilothermia, uh, and paralysis. Okay, the diagnosis of compartment syndrome primarily based on your history and examination. If you miss, then you are out of it. Okay, this is a cross section of amla. Uh, arm, forearm, and thigh. So each of them have their own compartment. Some have two, some have three, and some have four. Okay. Investigation, just like I said before, diagnosis, diagnostic tool, and urinalysis. Okay. And I have this uh, compartment syndrome pressure monitoring. I think the ED department still don't have, but going to have soon. Okay. This is the most common use. Most commonly used, which is 
striker device. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Striker device we put on cutoff point is around 30. Okay. For performing fasciotomy. Okay. And <coughs> okay. And the uh, diastolic, diastolic pressure, right side theory, development of a compartment syndrome depends not only on intra compartment, but also depend on your systemic blood pressure. So our uh, diastolic blood pressure minus uh, your compartment pressure should be greater than 30. That one is only for one type. Okay. As you all can see down here, we have our delta pressure. Delta pressure we have, we will measure uh, all the pressure in each compartment. Let's say our our my arm, my arm has two compartments. Okay. So <clears throat> um, in studies shows that delta pressures um, better correlate with potential irreversible muscle injury. So uh, how do you how do you how do you uh, cure your delta pressure? Okay, the first of course you have to know how to use striker uh, striker device. Okay, very simple. Put on an, put your needle, put on your string, and put on the machine. Make sure in your string uh, have some some uh, normal saline. Okay, close the cover, and you chuchu the compartment that you want to measure, okay? And slightly push a bit your fluids around 0 .0, 0 0.3, but make sure that you have um, turn the pressure monitor, lah, okay? All right, so let's say we already, that my arm has two compartments. We have already checked, okay? So you, <clears throat> and you get a uh, diastolic pressure, blood pressure, minus your compartment pressure bilaterally. If let's say less than 30, you should go urgent fasciotomy, okay? Right, okay. But let's say if only you are checking one compartment only, lah, okay? One compartment only, the normal value is zero to 10, and emergency is more than 30. If you like to take satu, you don't nampak ish. More than 30 already, 35 already. Then you have to cut lah. You can pass your tummy. Okay. At the same time, patient will be staying long in our ward. So, of course, we have to uh, observe the limb. Okay. This is a limb, uh, acute limb compartment syndrome observation chart. Okay. It's a very uh, important. You just can use passive and passive movement of the fingers here. Sometimes they are sakit, then you should be alert lah. Okay, this, this one you cannot see that much, tapi you boleh Google je, adik banyak je. Okay, acute compartment syndrome, definitive management is urgent fasotomy. And <clears throat> according to my colleagues, there have been a lot of fasotomies happen in ED, okay? Initial management prior to there are few uh upper fasciotomy happen in our ED. Lah. Initial management prior to definitive intervention include to keep the limb at a neutral level for fluid resuscitation and please remove all the dressing, spleen, and cast and treat with analgesia. Okay. I think that's all. This is my reference. So um I hope you guys understand uh, my presentation. Uh, thanks to my team for helping a lot. Okay, uh, now we go for quiz. Okay, uh, your quiz, uh, anyone can answer. Uh, EP also can answer. Got present, got hadiah. Okay.
Yeah, ready ah? Okay. Uh, the first price is a... Uh, the first price would be a big box of pepero. Very simple question. Okay. The second price also big box. And the third, fourth, fifth, it's just normal, normal pepero only last small, small one. Okay. Okay, next. Okay, question one. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, whoever answers the fastest and the right answer wins. Lah. Okay, question one. In a conscious multi-trauma patient, compartment syndrome of the forearm was diagnosed a few hours after injury, which included a fracture of the mid shaft of radius and ulna. So regarding the initial management of compartment syndrome, which one of the following step is least likely to be beneficial? Okay, anyone want to answer? Oh, big Oh, okay. Least likely to be beneficial, bro. The answer is B. Okay. You are right. The answer is B. Oh, uh, hello, Mark. Uh, sorry, this is only on the floor. The yeah. Uh, those at home can answer the Google Google spread punya question. Okay, next. Okay. Question two. Uh, a 30 year old factory worker presents after a crash injury to the left leg. Okay. You suspect you suspected compartment syndrome and obtain compartment pressure immediately. The pressure had been consistently more than 35. How do you interpret this reading? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Confirm, Eddie. Confirm. Eh? Okay. Confirm, dear. Eh? Okay. The answer is T. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the third question. Okay, if you all listen to my presentation properly, then you should know this answer. When is HD is indicated in crash injury? <laughs> Siapa jawab dulu tadi? So, the answer is C. You, you are right. Okay. Okay. Ini ah, ada ada dua, ada dua. Dua, dua, dua. Okay, uh, this one have to be fast, lah. Eh? Okay, uh, question four, eh? ready? Eh? Okay, regarding McMahon score, which one of the statement below is true? Okay, I heard some. Answers lah, you can angkat tangan. Okay, anyone want to angkat tangan? Okay, C ya. Yeah. Okay, so the answer uh, score of six greater had performance superior to CK for the prediction of HD. Okay, your answer is right.
Okay, so that you and why. So uh, my last question, I open to the houseman. Okay. Oh. Oh. Especially open to the houseman. It's a very simple question. Okay. Which of the following statement regarding management of rectomyelitis below is false? Um, hey, do the job. I will give it Okay, I open to houseman. Any, if no houseman, everyone. Okay. Many talk if prefer if prefer in patient with oliguric and aneuric. Okay. Okay. So your answer is right. A. Uh, sorry, uh, we uh, we still a bit got a bit uh presentation lah, a short one about ten slide only. After that, we will proceed to our makan makan section. Okay. So, my topic is a bit uh, simple, but a bit more detailed. Lah. So, actually, my one is I taken from the American College of Emergency Physician, Article 2019. Okay. So, how should we actually diagnose the compartment syndrome? Okay. So, uh, first, how sensitive is your sign and symptoms? Is it pain, paler, paralysis will be very sensitive? Do you think so? Is it very sensitive? Okay, what do you do now? Sensitivity is only almost like 20%, but if present, it's very specific. Okay, you have shoulder pain and pain with passive stress. The most important is the pain is out of proportional. For example, you look at your skin, it's very beautiful, nothing happened, but patient keep on screaming, ah, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. So there is no mangalitis, and possible patient have a compartment syndrome. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, don't forget about the open fracture also. Open fracture can have compartment syndrome also because uh, our leg and hand have a different compartment, okay? So how sensitive is your hand? Do you think you touch the patient, you can feel the tenderness, the sinus, I mean tenderness of your patient compartment? Do you feel patient uh, is in compartment syndrome by using your hand? Okay, so we have a study. So on cadaveric study, and also uh, both is on cadaveric on hand and leg graft. So they inject a uh, saline into the cadaveric, and then they ask all the EP and also surgeon go and feel the hand whether this patient is compartment syndrome or not. So in the end, uh, sensitivity is only fifty percent in upper limb. 25% in low limb. So please don't use your clinical examination sometimes, right? please. Okay. <laughs> so the other one. So a bit of uh, how do you use a striker device? So I only uh, involve on the hand and leg like, because uh, a, bit, a bit too much information already. So our hand is on a three compartment. So the forearm one, actually you should inject over the uh, the the upper region. Lah. So it's between the proximal and also middle third. You need to inject over the media over the pulmonary fungus. Okay. So the other one, you need to flip the patient hand over the supination position. Then you need to inject over the lateral position so that you can enter the mobile web of the compartment area. And the other one, you need to inject and reach over the uh, posterior aspect of the ulna and also one to two centimeter laterally. So bridges need to briefly know that for the exam purpose, we quite rare to have compartment syndrome nowadays because due to COVID. So this is our leg. So uh, our leg is a, uh, has a four compartment also. Don't forget the needle to be, uh, need to be inserted into the muscle area. So the anterior compartment, you need to get, in, get into the tibialis anterior. The other one you need to uh, ingest into the uh, this, the soleus muscle behind you. 
So I uh, need to know briefly the anatomical and how you should inject it. Okay. So no, just not just like inject line like into the muscle. So, okay. So technically, uh, how should we measure? Actually, got two methods. Uh, just like uh, run this is now. So our first thing is you can use a uh, delta pressure. It's mean your uh, or hyperbolic in diastolic minus compartment syndrome. So hyperbolic like so basically, this one is quite sensitive hypothesis patient, as a big, especially in polytrauma patient. Polytrauma patient, you only measure the compartment syndrome is not enough. You need to know the diastolic pressure, and then you need to know compartment pressure. So when your diastolic pressure is more than 30 to 40 uh, millimercury, the speed you have good position. So usually we go for conservative. If your diastolic pressure and inter compartment pressure is less than 30, the speed of position is not good. Okay, this is the hypotensive patient, polytrauma patient, and more advanced near uh, trauma. Okay, so if you only measure inter compartment syndrome, it's very simple, less than 30, or you measure more than 45, you have compression. This one I take from Intinali. Okay, so this one is the stored uh, striker. Actually, the, the striker is a brain name. You should answer solid state transducer intra compartment adapter. Okay, so the sensitivity is 95%, specificity is 98%. Okay. So, what if you don't have striker? Do you ever think of if we don't have striker, what should we do? Okay, so actually, we can use arterial line manometer. This one is a video uh, taken by a critical care in the US. I will show the video. Lah. Uh, I think uh, it's not very really clear the voice. I think I will go for the recording. First, we need to prepare the arterial line as usual, pressure back, the line. Okay, we will fasten it, how it uh, measure. You no know, issue for those who know how to pass on the arterial line. Okay, so actually, uh, they need to zero kind the of pressure. Okay, after you zero kind the of pressure, make sure the the port is the same level of the leg, okay? And then, you, first of all, you should know the anatomical plane you should inject. And then you should prepare a spinal needle because your usual needle cannot reach the compartment area, okay? So, as usual, surround, surround method, remove the spinal cane. Get the needle only. Connect with the actual line. Uh, we give some local anesthesia. Then you penetrate with. After you penetrate, look at the monitoring. You got the MAP. So you take the MAP as your internal compartment pressure. Then you minus off of uh, you minus with your body pressure. Then you got your data pressure. Okay. So this is a, a bit critical care when you uh, so. The other one, what if you don't have striker, you don't have papier line? What if? Okay. Do the other, do it into very uh, papier line, do the other. 
in a so we have a white side technique. Okay. White side technique is invented in India. So we only have very simple thing. We think that you know what you do, you should press she normal line. As you just uh, stir up area. Uh, mercury manometer, very ancient one. So you connect your manometer, mercury manometer, to a line. And then actually you should, uh, if the, the line should be injected with water first, So just around it. And you inject. Okay, so once inside uh, the tip, I think there's some water. So once it's moved, you can know the pressure. You read the mercury monitor, you can know the pressure. So this is the first thing I can think of. measure the interval performance pressure. It is what we call by site technique. Okay, uh, I think that's all for today. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions from bosses? Any uh, announcement? Congratulate to this group because uh, I don't see anyone speaking, which is very good. And then the presenter actually explained very, very well. And also the physiology is very well covered. Right? So you really have to, uh, uh, to me, uh, you can just see how uh, to do the assessment. The physiology has to be very, very, very good. Reason being because you have to convince the come down and reason, to give reason for whatever you need. And we need the knowledge of physiology and of course pharmacology. Kita tak boleh nak ada yang punya sendiri ya. But um, for physiology and um, pharmacology, uh, if you uh, are very strong at that, with me, um, you you can convince anyone. Yeah, sometimes we go to this machine for the good. Alright, so congratulations. And um, uh, probably um, the next group they are the Uh, IV, IV, IV drip. Uh, 
right? Uh, so because of that reason, right? that's why every time you must have passed over stuff that's like a place left, right? Then, um, ideally, but I mean, they just uh, want to be rushed and the other infection. But uh, actually, most important, yeah, I can tell you that COVID. <laughs> but anyway, we have the common syndrome. I think uh secondly to the IV line, especially in Jackery. Uh, because uh in Jackery, we want to drop a mucus, 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 so we need to not send that kind of All right, so um, apparently, um, when the bone cut, some cut, some cut, it can level, right? It can level the critical, and basically the patient was also to it. And actually, we want to send it in. What do you think you should do? So please remember that um, compartment syndrome that is commonly occurs in the hospital is because of that, uh, certainly it's because of the unit that is still in class. So we do have, uh, that's why we will, uh, I'm not so sure if uh, the OP cost maybe for paramedics, I think uh, for hospital especially, um, um, uh, the OP thing you have to know what are the advice that should be given to the patient and the sign is something that patient needs to come back. So usually you gotta be thankful that sometimes thank you that patient can be able to ask. So you have to explain the way as well and to ensure that they they actually uh, understand. So we do have patient young with a different in the auto follow up as in this graph of the combat also. So for the patient that come by it, you know, you just keep the class as well. Uh situation with the and then in terms of definitions, so you have to be different definitions, crash, crash injury, compartment injury, crash injury, compartment injury. Can you define all of that? Sometimes I don't want to Well, sometimes I don't want to say you can change it to your side of the or you must say you have to be very sensitive with your words. Use the correct word for correct term. Use the correct term for correct definition. Where is this on the So, if I say crash injury is it, is part of the anatomy, more easy to remember just a certain part, certain organ, certain part of the body surgery. But crash syndrome is system manifestation per se. In compartment syndrome, the compartment, the part of the compartment of the crash is for that. Then, yeah, and injuries are injuries. So basically, after uh, basic crash and cop of injury is crash and injury is really like a physical uh, muscle injury. Lah. So it's a direct muscle injury. But if you have a injury, it's usually indirect. So it's only much I mean, like a regulation in the structure or your fracture area, very bad. Or can also be because of the impact. 
But the syndrome is a complication of that injury. So crash injury can cause both compartment and crash syndrome. Okay, kalau dalam US, apa tadi saya dengar? Kalau crash injury macam mungkin lebih satu page di tajuk ni. Okay, page satu satu lapan empat tu. Okay, so. So basically, um, kalau kalau dalam kita ni kita saya ingat, guys, pernah kita lakukan. So, di sana one of the common cause of stress or crash injury is actually alcohol alcohol. Okay, sebab orang biasanya minum, masa pensen dua puluh empat jam tak lama, setelah itu dia sangat nyeri. Ini ada di mana mereka crash syndrome. Okay, so crash syndrome tu is a diffusion injury. Bila you dah beli semua benda dalam sel you, that is your crush syndrome lah. Okay, it's a complication. Kalau you dah panggil traumatic like you might access them. And then another thing is nampak mal. Nampak mal tu because of it, increase increase nampak mal tu pressure. Okay, so that will cause your blood vessel semua performance lah. Bagi syukur macam performance. Okay, so beware when you use the words lah. So she must be must be sabar. I think that's all I want to add. And how you remember your punya apa yang naik apa yang kena juga tu dengan tu yang tak sesuai fungsi. I think ada orang yang pun sedih buat interest dengan dia yang ada tinggi kan. Tapi ni mungkin yang tak tak ingat lah. Kan potensial is higher in cell, lower in muscle. So yang mana higher in cell, in rectal analysis atau pun kasih pun you raise lah. Selamat <laughs> I think this is uh, the only perayaan yang sempat sangkut cross border So, ramai boleh balik aku Mika, I rasa dia tak sangkut kawan-kawan pun um, Jumaat pun um, Ada yang dicuci So, I was quite surprised to get the same thing Because kalau raya ni, esok raya ni tak ada same thing kan Get the same thing, well that's very good presentation Was done in the very long manner So, uh, sesuatu yang sangkut di kawan ni tu Kan bangkat di kawan ni And please take care of yourself by the SOP. Balik sini kita tak wajib lah buat buat kalau you order pun ramai-ramai orang, kita tak wajib lah buat spot pun. Kita tak ada lah. 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 Yep. Thank you everyone for your presence. The last thing I want to say is breakfast is ready. You can go makan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One close. Okay. Thank you.